I would like to take a minute to talk about this week's sponsor, Upside. Upside is an amazing free application that lets you earn cash back just for purchasing the things you already do on a weekly basis, like gas or groceries. It's super simple to use and you'll quickly notice the benefits. My only regret is not downloading Upside sooner. Now with every purchase that I make, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. I started going to an awesome local restaurant right by my house and with the Upside app. I'm getting 7% cash back every time that I eat there. I've been going there a lot lately so it helps out a ton too. To get started, download the free Upside app and use my promo code MrCreeps and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business. Pay as usual with a credit or debit card and you get paid. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably why they have a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Download the free Upside app and use promo code MrCreeps to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Again, that's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code MrCreeps. For over a decade, I'd been reliving the year 2005. Each year, a rotation as I call the passing of every 365 days. The cycle begins anew. Same routines, same troubles in the news. Same people around me. The rotations don't begin on January 1st like you might be expecting, but instead on Christmas Day just before midnight. That was the night that I performed the ritual for the creature, Mr. Morgan Stern. For a decade or more, I've kept up my end of the bargain with Mr. Morgan Stern. But for some reason, this last rotation, this last Christmas, something went wrong. If you haven't guessed already, it was my wish that this limbo of 2005 repeat itself, for reasons that I'll get into later. I will say now that I had no choice. I had to do it. It was the best thing for everyone. Don't mistake this for a confession. I'm not confessing. I am not seeking forgiveness for what I've done. Nor am I repenting. I am beseeching your understanding, whoever you are listening to this, and perhaps with what's transpired, these posts are my last gasp at immortality. Friday, December 23rd. I meet my husband Josh at the first cup coffee shop off Mavis, like I do every December 23rd. Like every rotation before, he's sitting by the window wearing his crisp white button-down with the ebony cufflinks that I bought him for his 38th birthday. He's also wearing his cornflower blue necktie, his shark skin suit jacket draped along the shoulders of his chair. His winter coat is crumpled into an unsightly black mass on the seat next to him. There's a tiny espresso cup, the china unstained, glistening on the table. At 40 years old, he's still as handsome as the dashing young defense attorney that I fell in love with. Square jaw, high cheekbones, a fine Roman nose, and the most irresistible emerald eyes. His hairline is receded, the flesh of his temples now exposed, forming a kind of widow's peak, but I don't mind. I've tried to find his balding pattern, uncomely despite him, but I've never found his appearance any less appealing over the years. He looks up at me, regarding me with a put-on air of remorse. It worked the first time and brought me to my knees, in fact. This time, I'd rather he just drop the pretense and get it over with. I know what I am to him this day. One more drawn-out inconvenience on an already busy afternoon. Thank you for coming, he says, referring to the message that he left on the answering machine two hours ago. After seven rotations, I have the thing memorized down to the fillers and slight stammer on his pronunciation of the address. I didn't bother listening to it this day. I arrive, knowing the address by road. Hi, honey. I say to him, mustering all the housewifely sticky sweetness that I can muster. I wave off the approaching server, declining to order. Don't you need to get back to work? I ask, knowing the answer but needing to feed him the line for the confession to follow. 
I hope you're not here to tell me that the partners are expecting you to work on Christmas again. You know how much the children have been looking forward to seeing you for the holidays. No, Lorraine, that's not what I came here to tell you. Even after all this time, all the repetition, his words in that deadpan delivery still hit me like a sledgehammer to the gut. He didn't always call me by my name like that either, opting during our feverish courtship to call me low. But in these last 11 months, he'd address me formally by Lorraine. Okay, I breathe. I know what's coming next. I know how much it's going to hurt. The anticipation helps me regain my composure. With little effort, I turn to stone. My husband continues. I'm sure it won't come to a surprise that things have not been going well lately. What do you mean? I bleed, feigning ignorance. You mean at work? No, with us. Things have not been going well with us, Lorraine. When I had first heard this, I was gobsmacked. I genuinely believed that this year had been the happiest time we had been since getting married. For the first few rotations, I thought that he was lying, trying to make himself feel less guilty about what he was asking of me. But during these last a couple rotations, I have started noticing what he meant. What? I asked, trying to sound overwhelmed. What are you talking about? The fights, the nagging, the long days at work, the almost nightly binge drinking, the lack of sex. His frail mask of remorse had dissipated, his eyes souring with agitation and patience. I'm Lorraine, he huffs. There's no easy way of saying this. He stops, as though giving me a chance to absorb and anticipate what's next. Truth is, I'm already bored. I'm leaving. You're leaving. I speak as though stating a fact. I'm leaving you. I want a divorce. I feel my heart lurch in my chest. Divorce, what an ugly word. What a horribly sterile term to cover so much confusion and anguish. So much destruction. I try to put on the waterworks, not for sympathy, just to feel human. But after ten or more consecutive walkthroughs, I honestly can't be bothered. My mind wanders to the Daniel Steele paperback that I wish I had brought with me. You want a divorce? I exhale, my voice dead. He stares at me for a beat before his eyes flutter and his face scrunches with faint amusement. This isn't the reaction that he had expected. It is in the hysterical one that he got ten rotations ago. Yeah, he says carefully. That's right. I anticipate his next line of dialogue. After hearing it so many times, I've realized that he's rehearsed what to say. For a fleeting second, I amuse myself by imagining him practicing in one of the mirrors in the bathrooms at work, and ducking every time he hears someone coming in to use the can. I know that Mr. Morgenstern wouldn't approve, but I can't help myself from what happens next. Look, he continues, plowing forward. I love... You and the kids, I interrupt, reciting his lines back to him. It's just that I don't feel like living together is our best option anymore. Josh tilts his head, clearly confused. That's right, he utters, sounding almost like he's asking a question. Well, I sigh half-heartedly returning to the script. Would you consider seeing a marriage counselor, for Tobias and Jennifer's sake? Look, he snaps like he always does. My lips moving in sync with his. I've met someone. Someone. Who I'm serious about. Someone who makes me feel alive again. Someone I want to spend the rest of my life with. I roll my eyes and wiggle my fingers in the air as I mimic him. I then signal the server. I've decided that I do need a coffee after all. That's freaky. He says, his brow knitted. His eyelashes, butterfly wings. I just got deja vu. How, how did you know I was going to say all that? Ignoring him, I order a large dark rose to go. Lorraine, he says in a whisper, have we had this conversation before? I look deep into his eyes, seeing the genuine confusion on his face. There is the slightest glimmer of fear, or mortification, unable to resist, the sadistic pull too strong. I take it a step further. Is it that cute brunette that you've got? That receptionist just out of high school. The one with the nice rack and the mile-long legs. 
I notice his fingers, which are air typing like they always do when he gets nervous. The cufflinks catch my eye again. My neck bristles. I bet he doesn't even remember it was I who had gifted them to him. Just like he doesn't remember his precious study at her house. His hat loaded man cave all but boarded up now. His desk, bowling trophies, and football memorabilia collecting dust. I had always kept it clean but let it rot these past three rotations. Are we about done here? I ask, unable to hold my disgust. Wait a minute. Josh snaps, almost lunging across the table. My coffee arrives in a paper cup and I begin slipping on my coat. Wait a minute, Lo. Have you been spying on me? I let out a haughty little laugh. Oh, don't flatter yourself, Joshua. You're not that hard to read. D did you hire a PI or something? It's hard not to hate my husband at this moment. To not remind him like I had over ten years ago. Through my tears that I quit my job. Despite being on the short list for assistant prosecutor. Quitting so there would be no conflict with him and his law practice. So he wouldn't feel emasculated since for a while. I was making more money than he was. But he would inevitably fire back with the truth. I quit my job because I always wanted a family. Before turning to leave, I remember to say the last part of the script. Listen, Joshua, please come for the weekend at least. I think Tobias and Jennifer deserve one last Christmas with their family, unperturbed by the harshness of real life. And please don't mention this, not until after the holidays. Typically, his response is a begrudging acceptance, a reluctant acquiescence. This time, he stares up wallowed at me, as if not hearing or understanding. After a moment, he confirms that he understands with a slow, pendulous nod. I exit the little coffee shop. Once inside my SUV, I rummage in my plush winter coat for my keys, finding my cell phone instead. It's lit, indicating a missed call or a message. I flip it open, seeing a voice message from Simcoe Elementary, Tobias and Jennifer School. I listen to it, hearing a tinny voice requesting that I come to pick up my daughter immediately. Well, this is new. Having turned the engine over, I peel out of the strip mall parking lot and ease onto Mavis before driving west on Winston Churchill. I arrive at Simcoe around 1, just two hours before the students are to be dismissed for the break. Inside it's boiling, the heat cranked up to stave off the Canadian element hauling outside. The last time that I was here was for a painful parent-teacher interview. Don't get the wrong idea, my kids are smart and their grades are fine and they are no more poorly behaved than any other juveniles their age. In fact, they are more mature and better behaved than most. I wouldn't hesitate to even call them brilliant. It's just always a raw experience, hearing these revelations about my kids, how they are changing in ways that I haven't been privy to, how they are growing up and growing away from me. I sign in at the reception desk, get my visitor's sticker and then proceed to the adjacent hallway. My daughter Jennifer is sitting in a metal armchair, facing the open door of the principal's office. The principal, Mrs. Park, a pretty stout Asian woman, in a muted pantsuit is standing over her. Mrs. Park and I meet eyes wordlessly. I bend down and reach for my daughter's impish face. It's a pretty face, somewhat boyish, with red freckles and her father's brilliant green eyes. Besides the eyes and her close haircut, she looks just like I did at her age. Her forehead is damp and her short chestnut mop matted as though she had been sweating. I ask her quietly if she's alright. She looks up at me with a cold, emotionless stare. Thank you for coming, Mrs. Claiborne, says Mrs. Park. I take a moment to push a damp errant strand behind my daughter's ear before acknowledging the principal. What happened? I asked. Perhaps we should discuss this in my office, she replies guardedly, requesting a private conversation out of my daughter's earshot. I don't see why not. I follow her into the office and she shuts the door behind me. Mrs. Park's office is different from the rest of the school, including the narrow hallway in which my daughter is waiting. The walls aren't festooned with colorful paper cutouts of cartoon animals or balloon letters and fractions. No framed motivational posters either. Besides a six foot tall bookcase and a shabby black desk, 
Mrs. Park's office is as drab and empty as my husband's study, complete with a few bowling trophies. Something happened with my daughter, I ask, easing myself into a chair. Eyes downcast, Mrs. Park nods and sits behind the pine desk. Yes, as you may know, we tend to perform a biannual cleanup of the school, one before winter break and again before the summer holiday. This includes cleaning out the lockers of the grade 7s and the grade 8s, like your daughter Jennifer. To be perfectly honest, this is our school's way of having a sweep of all the lockers, to inspect them all at once. Yes? Her lips purse into a thin line. She then bends sideways, reaching below the desk. She places the following items before me. A roll of duct tape, a pair of black leather gloves, a pair of MMA-style protective gloves, a coil of hemp rope, a book on wilderness survival, a book on self-defense, and various knives and blades, some of which look to be home-fashioned. These were all found inside Jennifer's locker this morning. A wave of relief washes over me, so that's where she's hidden in this rotation. She tried to hide them by opening and closing her locker very quickly, telling us that she had already cleared it out. My god, I gasp, putting on the act. It has to seem like this is news to me. We've had our school counselor and psychologist speak with Jennifer. It's strange, but she seems to be under the impression that she's trapped um, Something about being trapped in a fake reality. Like the Matrix movies, she says. Knitting my brow, I squint hard at the principal. I'm not following. I lie, I know exactly what she means. Mrs. Park clears her throat. Um, she seems to believe that this world around her is fake and that she and her brother are the only real people. And that they are under threat by something. She couldn't really elaborate. But she did say that she believes that you are not her real mother. That she's already lived through this year, this school year, several times. And that her uncle specifically is dead. And that an imposter has been put in his place. That everybody's pretending he isn't dead even though he is. I swallowed hard. Jennifer thinks I'm not a real mother. Sitting stationary before the principal's desk, I let this sink in. Of course, I don't really have to. Part of the arrangement was Mr. Morgenstern was that only the four of us. Tobias, Jennifer, Joshua, and I would truly be stuck in 2005. Everyone else would be a holographic projection, since they were made only out of our memories and the manipulations of Mr. Morgenstern. As you would expect, this meant there were sometimes glitches in our reality, especially if that person had died in real life. I was told by Mr. Morgenstern that Joshua's brother, Jen's Uncle Freddy, had passed sometime in 2010, and thus the glitches became more prominent in that particular holograph. Even Mrs. Park, this woman sitting across from me, is just a hologram reacting to the disturbance my daughter has made in our little wonderland. Still, these holographs will act logically, including challenging me when reason dictates. May I ask? I begin slowly, careful not to overplay my hand. Do you have anything else of Jennifer's here? Well, yes, we have her school bag. We didn't find anything troubling inside. Well, may I see it? She tilts back down and retrieves my daughter's Hogwarts knapsack. I unzip the bag and pull out a thick black binder. Likewise, zippered shut. It doesn't take me long, and I've seen them before. Hmm, oh, there they are, I announce, finding a cluster of single sheet paper stuffed at the very back of the binder. I pluck them out and lay them neatly on the principal's desk so that she can see. Her mouth drops open like a hatch. A good grief, she whispers. Before her are a half dozen penciled illustrations all by my daughter of grotesque, malformed faces, and they all seem to follow the same pattern. Most of the faces look half human like the other half is distorted into dark, grisly shapes and textures. Fangs, a leathery skin, scales, tumors, horns, dead eyes. The eyes in particular are troubling. They have no sclera but are spiraled into oblivion. A single pinprick of white signifying the pupil. My daughter is quite the talented artist, though one with a grim, torturous muse. 
and worse, she's always been an especially precocious child. Having read Harry Potter, The Hobbits, and the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy before reaching her 11th birthday, I, Mrs. Park stammers, looking down at the pictures, I've never seen these before. I've seen them a hundred times, I state flatly. These are her impressions of what she sees around her. This one in the middle I recognize as her Uncle Freddy, the one that she told you's dead. Really? She's drawn that same ghastly visage before at home. On our walls, in fact, written the words of my uncle next to it. Mrs. Park, her mouth is still agape, looks up at me and says nothing. I blink long and then exhale. We believe Jennifer may be suffering from schizophrenia. Given her age and these hallucinations, it seems likely. We've started visiting a child psychiatrist. She hasn't come to a conclusion yet but she tells us that it doesn't look good. Oh dear. Mrs. Park puts a soft flipper to her mouth. I wait for her to compose herself so she can tell me what's next. I see, she says finally, gathering up the papers and jogging them against the desk. I'm very sorry to hear that. But, she looks up at me, my frankness catching her off guard. But I'm afraid that Jennifer will have to be suspended for two weeks seeing as though she brought a weapon or weapons to school. Two weeks following the winter holiday, I ask, indifferent for obvious reasons. That's correct. Fine, I'll take her home now, if you don't mind since I'm here. I'd like to bring my son Tobias home early as well. He's in sixth grade. I'm hoping that won't be too much trouble since it's the last day before break. No trouble at all, says Mrs. Park. She pulls open a squeaky desk drawer and produces a powder blue Bristol card. I'll have our receptionist call this homeroom teacher. We'll tell her that he's dismissed. I'm sure any homework or take home notices for the break have already been provided to him. She begins scrawling something on the card. I'm sure, listen, do you have a juice box or something, something that I can give my daughter to calm her down? A minute later, I'm sitting next to Jennifer, watching her sip fruit punch through a straw. I try cooing to her, playing with her hair, assuring her that everything's alright. Instead, she jerks her head out of reach and doesn't say a word. Two hours later, and the three of us are at home. Tobias and Jennifer are seated sedatedly on the living room couch, killing a thousand monsters on the PS2. Tobias, still an energetic happy-go-lucky boy, is into the game exclaiming and shouting sporadically with each killer hit to his video simulated life. Conversely, Jennifer stares dull-eyed at the screen, her thumbs rotating the analogs as though her hands belonged to someone else. I don't like the game they're playing, but it's still better than the World War II shooter that Tobias loves, a Call of Honor or something. I can't stand it with the gray images of historic warfare, not to mention the blare of gunfire and someone shouting, Good comrade, good, every five seconds. On the few occasions that he's home, Joshua especially loses his temper at Tobias, her playing with the volume too loud. I've always wished that Joshua wasn't so harsh with his son, Tobias being a spitting, be a gangling image of his father. Still, a few hours from dinner and Josh's hopeful arrival, I sink deep into the kitchen, hiding behind the inane sounds of my soap opera trilling from the mini TV. I have a pot of pasta on the stove. The pasta is something quick for dinner. I still need to prepare the mashed potato casserole and stuffing for the big day. Once I'm sure that no one's listening, I take out my phone and dial Mr. Morganstern's office. Morganstern Legion and Associates, blares the creature. His put on a smarmy voice, plowing through their company slogan, telegraphing it through the receiver. We sell dreams by the skyfall. It's me. Oh, hello, Mrs. Claiborne, he says, his voice glib and patronizing. Our Josh and the kids. Pretty crap, actually. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Joshua is still trying to leave me. Well, Mrs. Claiborne, I can only hypnotize Joshua into accepting this faux reality. It's your job to bewitch him into loving you. I'm sure a woman of your impeccable charm can handle that. That's not all. My daughter just got suspended from school. I thought they'd go on holiday soon. Well, they're on holiday now. So what's the problem then? 
They found a knife and rope and all kinds of paranoid crazy stuff in her locker. Ah, uh, so she hit it all at the school this time. Jesus Christ, Morgan Stern. The deal was that they wouldn't know that we were repeating the year. That things would be like they always were. Listen, Lorraine, baby, I told you over ten rotations ago. This reality has hypnotic effects on those inside it, even you. But they're not put under amnesia. In the end, the Marks have to believe that the world is as they see it and as they're told it is. There's no guarantee that some won't bug. It's up to you to keep up the facade. But what about my daughter, my sweet precious Jennifer? She's gone from that sweet, sweet little girl to a paranoid nut job. She thinks that I'm not even a real mother. Look, what can I say? Just spend some mother-daughter time together and give her some parental advice. I don't know. It's those glitches, especially the ones that occur when our Uncle Freddy is around. That holograph keeps morphing and what we see beyond it scares the daylights out of everybody. Look, okay, okay, relax. I'll see what I can do next rotation. Just make sure that you go through the ritual the night after tomorrow. Just don't blow your stack like this in anyone's earshot. We wouldn't want the facade to break down any more than it has. Oh, and one more thing. You haven't had any strangers come talk to you lately, have you? Strangers? What do you mean? You know, strangers, people you don't know. People who maybe don't seem like the typical holographs. No, no one like that. Why? Oh, good, good. Just keep it that way, all right. Go through with the ritual on Sunday and don't talk to anybody who shouldn't be there. Lots of luck. Saturday, December 24th. I know now that I never should have let them in. I knew at the time that I didn't have to. My eager just gets away from me sometimes, I suppose. After all, what do I have to hide? Jennifer and Tobias are tobogganing at the hill near our house. My husband Joshua is God knows where. When I hear the front doorbell ring, I'm busy vacuuming getting the house ready for Christmas dinner when I hear it. At first, I assume that it's a salesman, or maybe a Jehovah's Witness. Regardless, I put the vacuum aside and I go to answer it. On my front step, standing on the welcome mat, is a tall, handsome man. He looks at me with naive, almost childlike eyes. His womanish, blonde hair cascades down both shoulders from under his toque, giving him an angelic yet immature air. He's wearing a heavy winter jacket and boots, but I can see that he's wearing some sort of uniform underneath. I then hear a voice that isn't his. Hello, Mrs. Claiborne. I look at the man with the blonde locks closely. He hasn't even moved. Searchingly, I crane my neck into a near panoramic sweep of the cul-de-sac, trying to find the source. Our home rests at the back of a horseshoe-shaped line of other houses with square lawns, driveways, and picket fences. Mrs. Claiborne, the voice calls a second time. I step out into the welcome mat so that I have a view all the way down to the footpath, which ends where my front steps begin. There I see a stocky, red-haired woman sitting in a wheelchair, wearing clothing similar to the blonde man beside me. She has what looks to be a thick, black binder on her lap. Part of my drive is an industrial van, painted burgundy. Good morning, Mrs. Claiborne, she says, smiling with practiced sincerity. My name is Christine, and the man on your front step there is Nicholas. If possible, we'd like to come inside. What's this about? I ask, not too rudely. Well, if you don't mind, Mrs. Claiborne, it's very cold out here, and snowing. I was hoping you and Nicholas could help carry me into the house. I don't have the use of my legs, you see. This takes me slightly aback. The woman had not said these things in a chastising or self-pitying way, though a bit cloying. She strikes me as very professional and empathetic, and I feel a wash of shame for not immediately offering to help this wheelchair-bound creature. That's fine, I say, trying to match your sincerity and affableness. But what is this in regard to? Well, your daughter, says the woman, her voice carrying over the moan of the wind. Jennifer. A children's Aid Society, of course. Probably here because of the principal. Concerned over what she found in Jen's locker. 
Sighing, my shoulders slumped and I nod my head, resigned to this predictable indignity and invasion of my home. Again, I know I could have declined, that I could have made them give me whatever notice they had for me to sign out there in the cold, or I could have just refused them outright and told them to get scoffed. But in that moment, the wheelchair-bound woman moves me with her sincerity and rather pitiful condition. Also, I figured it would be better to let them in and get it over with. After all, what do I have to hide? I have insulted my steps in the last few days. I called on to her, feeling no cause to address the six-foot-two mute standing to my right. I'll open up the garage door, it's dry in there, and your friend and I can lift you in through the laundry room. Would that be alright? I can see then her beaming smile through her scarf and ensnaring her red hair. That sounds fine, Mrs. Claiborne. It takes a moment navigating her through the garage, around the SUV and the kids' scattered toys, though she is surprisingly light to carry up the steps and into our cramped little laundry room. Without any more help needed for me, the tall mute wheels Christine into the front hall and from there the dining room, attached to the kitchen. Besides cleaning, I've been preparing the mashed potato casserole for tomorrow. I still have to drive to Longo's later to pick up our turkey, special ordered. Not seeing a reason not to, I brew them each a cup of tea and one for me as well. Thank you so very much, says Christine holding the steaming mug in both hands, her fingers red from the cold. Her attendant, Nicholas, doesn't touch his cup, letting it cool on the kitchen table as if sending a freeze ray with his eyes. I sit down, ready to listen. The woman places her thick binder on the table and then unzips it. She tosses aside a few pages before coming to her report. I'm gritting my teeth, I wait to hear about Jennifer's behavior and these suspicions of maltreatment or neglect. So, we're here regarding an incident involving your daughter, Mrs. Claiborne. She begins, innocent enough. Yes? We were informed that the following items were found in your daughter's locker at school. One roll of duct tape, two pairs of combat style gloves, 15 feet of hemp rope about an inch in diameter, two books related to self-defense, and seven knives and blades, three of which looked to be self-made. There was only one book on self-defense, I corrected her. The other was on wilderness survival. Oh, thank you, I'll make that correction for the file. I note immediately that neither she nor her mute Nicholas are writing any of this down. Their eyes just bore into me while their hands rest motionless. And how has Tobias been adjusting? She then asks. I screw up my eyes at her. Adjusting to what? While well, adjusting to the current condition of the home. About some of the changes that have occurred with you and your husband. Digesting this, I stare back at her and then scan her and Nicholas's face. Okay, who the heck are you? Their benign expressions twist into four scowls. They look at each other with a rehearsed air of puzzlement. I'm sorry, Mrs. Claiborne. Christine asks, keeping up the candied enthusiasm. I thought you were CPS, but that's obviously not the case. What do you mean, says Christine, shaking her head with too much force. Of course, we're from Children's Aid Society. If you were CPS investigators or social workers, you would have immediately asked to speak with Jennifer, or at least asked where she was. The mock confusion on her face wilts, leaving only blank recognition. She's not contrite but ready to get serious. There's also no way you would have any idea about me and my husband. I carry on. There's never been an incident related to us reported before, and trust me, I would know if someone was going to make an allegation about us and our relationship. So who the heck are you two? When Christine speaks again, her face is etched in stone, her voice backed with steel. Do you really think the arrangement you made with Morgan Stern is fair, Lorraine? It's now my turn to play dumb. What? I ask scrunching on my nose for a fact, wobbling my head from side to side. Do you really think it's fair to Jennifer and Tobias, 
your children or your husband Joshua for that matter? And are you even happy here in this contrived limbo or a purgatory that you willfully confine yourself to? I don't know what you're talking about. I lie. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Slumping back in my wicker chair, I send darts their way with my eyes. If you understood my reasoning, you wouldn't be asking if it was fair. And what is your reasoning? I scoff. Oh, you wouldn't get it. Try me. I don't respond. What's the point? She's only trying to bait me. I look down on my chai tea and can no longer see steam coming off it. Feeling how cold these ceramic is gone, I pick up my mug and stand from the table, my vocation the sink. I toss the iced fluid and give them my back, waiting for them to vacate my home. We're not here to change anything, Lorraine. I hear Christine's voice. What's going to happen has already been put in motion. We're just hoping to avoid any needless violence. I spin on her, my face hot and contorted. What the heck does that mean? I thunder. She says nothing. Again, I look down the cast iron basin by my waist, waiting for them to be gone. We cannot save you, Lorraine, she says. No one can. But maybe we can save Tobias and Jennifer. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what any good parent would want for their children? A tremor courses my spine. I grip the counter ledge, my knuckles white. Get out of my house. I don't hear them get up. I don't hear the squeal of rubber over the linoleum or the creaking of footsteps. When I look back at the dinner table, both of them are gone, vanished like into thin air. The only indication of their ever being here is the cups of tea, which are now like ice, almost freezing to the touch. Near livid, I grab the vacuum and begin cleaning ferociously around the house. I then toss the machine to the ground, too flustered and begin a sweep of all the rooms, looking for any weapons that Jennifer might have stashed at this rotation, anything that I might have missed. I start with hers and then Tobias's bedroom, turn both upside down but find nothing, still not satisfied. I storm down to the basement and check the spot where Jennifer hid her weapons the last two rotations, in the crawl space below the floor. I've already checked it five times this month and the sixth time yields no new results. I then remind myself that if Uri found her annual arms cache at the school in her locker, I forego the rest of my search. Still far from calm, I go to the kitchen and pour myself a whopping glass of Chardonnay, downing it within a minute and then refilling. After consuming half of my second glass, I check the casserole in the oven. It's fine, of course, and I end up singeing the webbing of my hand from opening the door without an oven mitt. Sucking on the red, throbbing flesh between my thumb and forefinger, I grab the kitchen phone and dial the number of the creature. Morganston Legion and Associates. His voice blasts from the receiver. If we can't. Morganstern. I cut him off, my voice sounding like I've been chewing glass. Mentally, I recite my prepared ultimatum. After tomorrow, you better have fixed this dang trance and gotten my family back to normal. I swear to God, you will not like what happens if I'm dissatisfied in the next rotation. I try to work up the nerve to say this out loud, to curse him over the phone, but instead, my voice catches in my throat and I just croak and sputter like an idiot. Hello, Mrs. Claiborne says the creature after a minute. I place the receiver back on its hook, ending the call. There's no point making idle threads, because that's what they are, idle threads. What can I possibly do to Mr. Morganstern if this illusionary world keeps breaking down? What can I do at all? Sunday, December 25th. Dinner. Christmas Day begins, as usual, this rotation. The kids, or at least Tobias, wakes me up at around five, desperate to open up some of the presents gathered under the tree. As is custom, he can open the ones gifted to him for me and his dad, but must wait until our guests arrive to open the rest. Like on the previous rotation, I'm a bit choked up that Jennifer is elected to sleep in this morning, not bothering to see what Santa Claus has left her. 
irksome still is that Joshua, my husband and father to my children have not shown up yet. It doesn't take the wildest imagination to figure out where he's spending his nights. Still no bother. He always shows up at around dinner time. I make Tobias the typical Christmas breakfast. A serving of eggs benedict on a toasted English muffin with yellow hollandaise sauce drizzled on top. Just a whiff of that edgy, savory aroma causes my head to fog with a delightful holiday nostalgia. I make a plate for myself beside a cup of black coffee and a third serving for Jennifer, which ends up going cold before being slung into the wastebasket. For the actual dinner party, I have everything that I need. I've made all the desserts four days prior, baked the potato casserole yesterday, chopped up all the veggies and made the stuffing. All I need to do is pop the turkey in the oven. I grit my teeth and sulk a bit, figuring that Josh won't show up in time to carve the gosh dang bird. While waiting for the entree to cook, I while away the hours in the kitchen, reading a John Grisham novel. By five in the evening, everybody has arrived. My mother, my father, Joshua's parents, Edna Claiborne, and Nee Walsh, and the glitchy hologram that now makes up my husband's brother, Freddy, and a half dozen more of my cousins, nieces, and nephews. Everyone who is supposed to be here has arrived. Everyone except for my husband. This is odd. He is usually late, yes, but he always makes it in time for dinner. Every rotation. And this isn't good. Everybody asks where he's at, even Freddy. And I plaster on a glowy rick to smile and assure them that he must have just got caught up at work. The back of my neck nettled like a growling Doberman, knowing that he's likely with that girl. Painfully, I keep my chin up the rest of the meal and carry on during dessert and coffee like I always do. I regale my dinner guests about my darling children, bragging while simultaneously making small complaints about them, even while Jennifer and Tobias are sending optical arrows my way. I know patronizing, but this is what all young children must endure until they marry and have families of their own. Truth is, it's all an act this year. All I can think about is what I'm going to do if Joshua doesn't show before midnight, and how I'll find him if I need to. The temptation to call Morgan Stern is there, but I know that he won't help. This is my end of the bargain, my responsibility. By 8.30, most of our guests have piled out into their cars, ready to brave the snowy December night on their journeys back home. Joshua's parents are the first to leave, disappointed their son couldn't be there, followed by Edna and the thing that has replaced Freddy. Before leaving, Freddy takes a moment to speak to me about his brother. It's a battle on my part not to recoil from him. The flashing glimpses of his true form revealing a figure both malignant and misshapen. Recalling old photographs of the elephant man. I don't retain a word of what he says. Behind my agonizing smile, I'm estimating where to find Joshua and how quickly to do it. If he's at work, it would only take about an hour. Maybe more given the bad weather. If he's with the girl, that could take longer. I would have to take care of Tobias and Jennifer first in that case. Yeah, it's best to get those two out of the way. By 10 o'clock, the guests are all gone. I've changed out of my dinner dress and into some comfy house clothes. Despite my fears that she would resist, Jennifer agrees to sit down with Tobias on the living room couch and complete one of our annual rituals, watching old movies on the TV. It's a little too early for the televised rendition of A Christmas Carol, starring Alistair Sam, so I put on a burnt DVD for my favorite VHS, the classic comedy short Dinner for One. More of a New Year's Eve tradition, I know, but my family is Norwegian, and I just can't resist the sweet little comedy. As Heinz Piper introduces the sketch in his regal German, the sentimental old-timey music filling her home, I retreat into the kitchen and grab two of my children's favorite mugs. Frosty the Snowman for Jennifer and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer for Tobias. I pluck the rubber gloves from the lip of the sink and fit them over my hands before putting on a blue paper mask. I'm now ready to reach into the cupboard under the sink and retrieve the vial of cyanide. I have done it now at least 10 times and it's pretty easy. Just a drop in the bottom of both cups and then the cocoa powder, and then hot water and then stir. 
I know better than to carry the mugs to my kids. Too much at risk of exposure. I don't want to kill myself before it's my time. But this year, I wait to do any of that. To even unscrew the cap from the vial of poison. My husband has still not arrived. It won't do anything if he isn't here too. And worse, what if he arrives and finds the children dead? Will he presume that they're asleep? Not if he catches them in their last agonizing spasms for life. No, I need to deal with these two and then I can worry about Josh. And if I need to brave the night's howling gale to find him, well then so be it. As though answering my prayers, a white light crosses the kitchen via the window, indicating a vehicle entering our cul-de-sac. I look out the window and see Josh's 95 Lincoln Town Car. It lurches up the drive, the front driver's seat side wheel rolling over the lawn and sinking into the snow. He's drunk. Hastily, I unscrew the cap of the vial and drip the poison into both mugs and pour the chocolate mix, and I stir the hot water. Tobias, Jennifer, come get your hot cocoa. It's on the kitchen counter. I call to them, making sure to put some distance between myself and the spiked beverages before removing my mask. I had already given Josh's decanter a boost hours ago. A triple whiskey neat, being his yuletide tradition while vegging out with the kids. I'm still wearing rubber gloves when I hear my husband stumbling against the front door. Jogging toward it, I witness the door rip open. My husband standing slantwise, still clutching the brass knob. An eddy of snow preceding him. With his disheveled trench coat and hair damply dotted white, he looks like a euphoric Jimmy Stewart at the end of It's a Wonderful Life. As I had suspected, he is drunk. But still, this is all very new. Merry Christmas, low, he says, his voice an octave too loud. Despite the weather, I can see that he's flushed and sweaty. His eye looks like a pea swimming in a tiny saucer of buttermilk. Without closing the door, he leans in and embraces me. I'm too stunned to reciprocate. This hasn't happened before. Neither before nor during the rotations. Feeling the brush of his 10 o'clock stubble against my cheek, I smell the sourest smoke of scotch through his pores. And then he whispers into my ear. I ended it. I almost didn't hear him. The bludgeoning repetition of the same disappointment, year after year hardening me to any sliver of hope. He then pulls back although he's still crushing me, and his nose is a mere inch from mine. Did you hear me? He asks, his whiskey-laced breath crinkling my nose. I ended it. I'm done with that woman. All I want is you, Lo. All I want is you. Breathless, I feel my heart punch its way through my ribcage. My throat constricts and my eyes turn damp. No longer bothered by Josh's single malt heltosis. I lean in and kiss him hard in the mouth. He reciprocates and for a fleeting moment we just stand there in the gusty doorway, swapping spit like teenagers. Remembering myself I pull back, knowing that the ritual is not complete. I think we both need a drink. I whisper into his collarbone, trying to seek you to what must be done. I then feel him pull away from me. Are you kidding? He remarks, knitting his brow, a sloppy smirk curling his cheek. I'm well into the bag, though. The last thing I need is a pick-me-up. No, what I need is my wife on top of me. The front door slams shut, and I can feel the strong arms begin to pull me into the house. My mind races to plan B and I grab my handbag from the coat rack. You don't perform the same ritual every year and not have a backup when things go sideways. The first time, nothing went according to plan and it all ended very messily. Josh doesn't notice me carrying a purse as he drunkenly dance walks me across the shoe mat and into the front hallway. I notice but don't register that Tobias is the only one planted in front of the TV as we pass. Where's Jennifer? Figuring that he won't make it up the stairs in his condition, I opt to lead him into his all but shuttered study. The children surely won't hear us in there. Inside the room is pitch dark, musty, and dry. It smells of mothballs and old yellowing paper. Before I know what's happening, Josh has his trousers around his ankles and has me propped up, spread eagle on the desk. 
I let him yank down my black tights and underwear as we kiss and grope feverishly. And grasping a chilled lapel of his wool cashmere coat, I wrench him in closer. Still, with the wherewithal to place my hand back beside me while within rage. I feel him inside me and begin to groan. In his inebriated state, we aren't so much making love as we are attempting to parallel park. While he grunts and grinds, thrusting with all the precision of a blind archer, I zip open my bag and fish out the item, a cyanide-filled syringe. You must understand I don't want to do it. I don't want this moment to end, but end it must, and I need to keep up my end of the bargain with Mr. Morganstern. After the better part of a minute, my husband's groans peak into piercing wails. He's taken his slobbered chin off my shoulder and is now arching towards the ceiling. Realizing his near climax, I choose the only course of action that will be both undetected and mercifully quick, reaching around him with my left hand to get a handful and then piercing his buttocks with the needle in my right. I feel him clench into an iron clamp in fear that he's about to pull away, but he instead continues to go at it. I keep both hands in place, burying the plunger with my thumb. After another couple seconds, I feel him finish. Like a tranquilized zoo animal, he goes limp and he drimps off of me, falling with a thud to the floor. He lies there, limbs akimbo, and begins to spasm and convulse. Choked, I look away, trying desperately not to envision the look of horror in his face, or the white foam bubbling over his lips like a cauldron. It doesn't take long before the tremors that seize his body cease, and he's lying cold and stiff across the carpet. One down, two to go. Three if you're counting me. Panting, sweaty and more than a little blue, I take a moment to compose myself, pulling my pants back on and scanning the otherwise forgotten room. I look down at the other side of my husband's desk where he would have sat, and that's when I see it. A thick strand of brown hemp rope protruding from underneath. I follow it under the desk and find what I had feared. My daughter's survival kit, consisting of the coiled mile of rope, rolls of duct tape, fighting gloves, and various knives and blades. Crap, I hiss. I then wonder if her stash of weapons at the school was just a ruse. A trick so that I wouldn't check the house as thoroughly as I had on previous rotations. How could I have been so stupid? I then hear the slightest creak like the house settling and swivel my head toward the door. I had locked him when we came in, but at the little horizontal opening at the bottom, I can see the shadow of two feet standing just outside. Jennifer. For the moment, it occurs to me that I have the only available key to the office, assuming that Josh has either lost his key or has it on his person. It then seemed perfectly natural to just wait it out try to negotiate with Jennifer through the locked door, since there's no way for her to get in and I have all her weapons at my disposal. Of course, that won't do though. Midnight is approaching and I can't be sure that either she or her brother have taken their medicine. With her, surely standing outside the door, there's no reason for me to believe that they have drunk their toxic beverages. Plus, how did she get in here before? Swallowing my instinct for motherly love and my desire to hunker down, I take up one of the blades, a serrated steel hunter's knife, from under the desk and creep toward the door. In one swift movement, I unlock the door and wrench it open. As I had suspected, my daughter tries to sprint past me charging for her stash, but she doesn't get too far. Having anticipated this move, I kick my foot in front of her path and send her diving to the floor. Landing on her belly and the heels of her hands, she lets out a gasp before rolling over onto her back. Her belly exposed to me like the neck of a wildebeest to a lion. I sink down next to her, one hand out to soothe her while the other holds a ready the knife. Shh, it's alright, sweetheart. I croon, drawing nearer. Her tears and gasp for air are like pins in my heart. But regardless, I must be strong. It's just like when you were little and you fell down and scraped your knee. Mama's gonna kiss the boo-boo and make it all better. As though she had been playing possum, Jennifer grabs a hold of my wrist and then presses a forearm into my elbow, before rolling over onto her belly and putting all her weight down on my arm. I squeal both in shock and pain as I feel her drive me down into the carpet, like a wrestler on TV. She doesn't keep me down for long now. I mean, how could she? 
her being five foot nothing and weighing 90 pounds soaking wet. A scuffle, a real Donnybrook breaks out, the two of us biting, scratching, tearing at each other's hair. I mostly dominate, able to almost stand back up while Jennifer latches onto me like a giant flailing barnacle. Her nails dig and pry at my wrist, trying to get to the knife, but I never relinquish it. After I can't say how long, I finally get squarely to my feet and with all my might, manage to hurl Jennifer off my shoulders, sending her crashing again to the floor, this time on her back. I hear her breath flee her body, knowing this time she really does have the wind knocked out of her. Not taking any chances, I stomp my foot heel first into her stomach and keep it there. She squirms and struggles with what strength she has left, but it isn't enough. I know that I have her. Two down almost, two more to go. Using my heel to keep her pinned, I find my balance and take aim at Jennifer's heart, raising the knife Michael Myers style. I hold it up high to get a good stabby motion, but then I see something out of the tail of my eye, a blur of a human rushing towards me. It's Tobias, and he's carrying something that I can't make out. I turn too late. Tobias, no! Something long strikes me in the back of the head, the pain wrapping around to my temple. Everything goes black. Sunday, December 25th, almost midnight. I wake, I don't know how many hours later. The back of my head is throbbing, ballooning, like from the most unimaginable hangover. The headache is the first thing that I notice. The second is the feeling of something coarse and constricting around my arms. I look down and discover that I am lashed to a chair. My arms are bound by rope and duct tape. I can't see them, but can feel my ankles likewise as shackled to the chair legs. In front of me, I see my children, Jennifer and Tobias. They're looking down at me like executioners. It doesn't fully register at first, but Jennifer has something. A wad of folded paper in her hand. I try to speak, but then think better of it. For whatever reason, they haven't duct taped my mouth shut. Instead of speaking, I take a moment to study each of their faces, as best as I can through my understandably hazy vision. Jennifer's face is hard and determined, though I see a light in her eyes that I thought had died as several months ago. However, when I look into Tobias's eyes, I see fear, real fear and trepidation, an opening. What time is it? I ask, my voice hoarse and cracking, trying to pull at any heartstrings. This is an easy act to pull off since I genuinely am panicked about the time. Jesus, my head hurts. Listen to me, you have to tell me what time it is. Chewing his another lap, Tobias turns to his sister, deferring to her. I look at her and then glance at the papers in her hand. Are those more hideous portraits of Uncle Freddy? She says nothing in response. By then I know that she knows that she has the upper hand. The time is on her side and not mine. Okay, okay, listen to me. I beg, writhing in my constraints, desperate to wriggle free. Crap, she's tied these ropes tight. Listen to me, you two need to loosen my ropes, all right? You need to let me out of this chair right now. Jennifer doesn't stir, and then she says one word. Why? Right then, I get this unexpected sensation of deja vu. You would think that would be something that I get all the time, but in this moment, I can't place where the feeling is coming from, or when I had experienced this before. Why? I bleat, still afraid and trying to play it up for sympathy. Because, because if we don't do something, something before midnight, we're all going to die. Jennifer's a rock, but Tobias begins to stir. It's, it's ten minutes to midnight, he says, saying it as though afraid his words might ignite a powder keg. Jennifer throws him a quick look. Relieved, I let out an exacerbated sigh. Good, then we're not too late. Untie me. How are we going to die, Lorraine? Asks Jennifer, more as a charge than a question. Why did you kill Dad? There isn't enough time. Well, you're going to have to make time. Sighing heavily, I nod, acquiescing to my daughter's condition. 
Ten or more years ago on Christmas, your father came home drunk from the office, much like he did tonight. I had caught him having an affair with his secretary. I told him earlier in the week that I was going to leave him. I was going to divorce him and get full custody of you two. You know what that means, a full custody. They both nod their heads, clearly understanding that I'm not being pedantic. So he got mad, really mad and told me that he would sooner see me dead than in court. You two have to understand, a divorce can cost a lot of money, especially if you've been caught cheating on your spouse. At the time, I just took what he said as him letting his emotions get the better of him. I never thought of it as a threat until it was too late. Anyway, he came home drunk on Christmas after all our guests had left, like he did tonight, but this time with a gun. He shot me, shot the two of you, and then turned the gun on himself. He shot me first, but only once and in the chest. The bullet had pierced my lung, and I think he did this intentionally so that I would suffer. Now I know this is going to sound ridiculous. Incredible, but you must believe me. This is true. This is what happened next. A man that I had never seen before appeared in the room as I lay there dying. He was tall, very pale, even chalky, with frizzy red hair. He wore a loud, checkered suit and tan shoes. He knelt beside me and offered me a deal. If I were willing to complete a ritual every Christmas day before midnight, we would be able to live this year over and over in perfect happiness, or near perfect happiness. All we had to do was complete the ritual. Otherwise, when we died, we'd be banished to the darkness, complete oblivion. No afterlife, good or bad, just nothing. I made the deal so that the three of us could live out some semblance of a happy existence. That's why I need you to untie me, and then drink your cocoa in the kitchen. Silence permeates her home. I don't hear a thing save for the faint voices floating from the TV room. Knowing that I have to move this along, I venture a look up at my daughter, but she's unmoved. That's the same story that you told me before. Taken aback, I rock in my imprisoning chair. What did you just say? What kind of a gun did Dad use? Squinting, I shook my head. My face flushed. I don't know. I don't know anything about guns. But neither does Dad. Tobias chimes in. Digesting this, I soon realize an oversight of my story. Tobias is obsessed with those shooter games, which have instilled in him an interest in warfare, even world history as well as firearms. His father had always hated guns, has always hated guns and has never been shy proclaiming his hatred of them. Tobias, being the closest to Joshua, has probably observed this the most acutely. Of course, Joshua wouldn't use a gun. He wouldn't know how, let alone where to get one. And Jennifer interrupts my internal dialogue. You told us this same made-up story a few years or whatever ago, Lorraine. Or you told me, Tobias here wouldn't listen to me the first time and was on your side. When you told me about it, I believed you because I snooped into daddy's emails and found all the messages to that lady. Jennifer then stops to have a little laugh. Having an affair, she says more to herself. That sounds like such an adult term, like a euphemism. That part of your story made sense. But then I did some research at the local library and found out that we have a no-fault divorce law here in Ontario. So it doesn't matter that Dad had an affair and you knew about it. So why would he kill us? Without the aid of the swelling goose egg, my brain is spinning. I've told her this before. Of course, I know Jennifer has tried to stop me in previous rotations, but I don't remember this kind of confrontation. I suppose since they're all the same, each rotation just blurred into one until... Look, look, I stammer out, still not ready to throw on the towel. I don't know what was in your daddy's head. I just, I just... You're a lawyer, Jennifer interrupts, just like daddy. There's no way you told us that as an honest mistake. You killed us. You killed us all. No, I thunder, my turn to cut her off. I tried to save you, I tried to save all of you. Why can't you understand that? Why can't you appreciate how much I've sacrificed? How much of my career and my very life I gave up for you? How can you be so selfish? I gave up being an assistant prosecutor for the city. 
Do you even know what that means? I could have been the city prosecutor, which would have laid the entire city, the whole country at my feet. How can you be so cruel, so ungrateful? I gave you everything, everything. I don't need to pretend anymore. The waterworks have started and they are real. No longer feeling the expanding throb at the back of my head, I let my chin and my collarbone and weep. The agony rushing through my heart has stripped all fleshy wants from my body. And then I hear the worst possible sound. One that hasn't visited my ears in over a decade. Our grandfather clock. The one standing in our living room. It begins to ring the twelve consecutive chimes announcing the arrival of midnight. I'm too late. I failed to keep my end of the bargain. What would Mr. Morgenstern do to me? And to us? The three of us just stand there wordless in the time it takes. The twelve consecutive bells punctuating my defeat with each resounding ring. My face wet with tears. I just stare mouth agape. I'm in a silent scream at my children. When it's over, Jennifer finally relieves me of her cindering stare. With a small sigh of her own, she instead looks down at the sheets of paper clutched in her tiny hands. Now you've done it, I hiss. I'm not trying to barter anymore, not trying to manipulate my children. I'm satisfied with taunting them, especially Tobias who stole the fans. Now we'll be banished to the blackness, the darkness, to oblivion, and it's all your fault. I don't think so, Mom, says Jennifer unfolding the pages. Her voice is soft, even sweet. I grow nostalgic, thinking of the untainted little girl that I had made this cursed bargain for in the first place. I think you should read these. She then places three pieces of printed paper fanned out so I can read what was written on them, on top of my thighs. There are news articles, one from the Toronto Star, one from the Toronto Sun, one is even from the New York Post. They are all from December 2005. The first headline that catches my eye reads, Hideous murder in suburbia. Mother poisons son, stabs daughter, and causes daughter's death. A second reads, Extended family baffled. This wasn't the love that we knew. A third, Poison found on daughter and husband also. Original murder plot gone awry. After getting the picture, I stop reading and instead gawk at them marveling at their existence. Where did you get these? I ask. Well, in the library at the university. Jennifer answers, and no newspapers would have printed these. I found them in the microfiche. That's where you can find things that aren't a part of this world you made. Shooting her a cutting look, I search her face, trying to figure out the lie. How did you know how to look in the microfiche? How did you even know what that was? To this, Jennifer is silent, averting her eyes from mine. It then dawns on me. Someone told you. Somebody pointed this out to you. Probably even planted them there. Who was it? Mrs. Park, Uncle Freddy. Aunt Edna. Wait, no. It was that woman, wasn't it? That wheelchair woman, Christine or Christine or something. Her evasion confirms my suspicion. It was that interferer, that agitator who came to my house yesterday. That home-wrecking crippled. Ugh. Her voice then dints inside my skull. What's going to happen is already been put in motion. We're going to leave now, Mommy. I hear Tobias's timid voice from somewhere in the room. I find him with a start, seeing that he's now holding one of Jennifer's blades. I don't want to leave you tied up, but we can't risk you attacking us. I'm going to cut the ropes around your arms, but not the ones around your legs. You should be able to untie those after we go. Please don't try anything after I cut you free. Please, Mommy. I don't say anything. There's nothing left to be said. I just sit there muttering to myself, feeling my constraints momentarily get tight and then loosen and release. I want to put up a fight. I want to reach up with my newly freed hands and tear my only son's eyes off from their sockets and then make a wild grab for Jennifer. But I don't. There's no point to it. The truth is, I lost everything years ago. Mommy, I hear Tobias's voice a final time. Can I ask you something before we go? I don't respond. I don't even acknowledge hearing him, knowing the question that he wants to ask. 
Tobias doesn't say anything further. The question laughed and said, Staring off into space, I am barely conscious of the front door swinging open, followed by the whistling yell encroaching into my home before being banished by the door slamming shut. I then become aware of the unmistakable murmur of an engine belonging to a large vehicle, idling outside of our home. On inertia, I turn my head, twisting in the chair, trying to get a glimpse of at her driveway via the window. I'm too far and too low to the ground to get a good look, but I can still make out the dark shape of exhaust pluming up into the night sky, illuminated by the reflected yellow glow of high-mounted headlights. At this moment, my mind whirling and sore, I don't know what to make of the strange, unseen vehicle. Now writing this, I'm certain who it was. Christine and her mute. They had found my children and poisoned their minds, turned them against me, and conspired to leave with them, leave to God knows where. When I hear the crunch of heavy tires across the packed snow, the fate of the purring motor, I know that they're gone. My bargain with Mr. Morgenstern is over. If you made it this far, you're probably wondering what the actual bargain was that I made with the creature, Mr. Morgenstern, a decade or so ago. How did my family and I come to relive the year 2005 over and over again? Well, here it is. Just like it was two days prior, my husband had asked to meet with me at the first cup coffee shop off Mavis. When I had first listened to his message on the answering machine, I didn't think anything of it. Ignorant, I presumed everything was fine. But when I got there, much as it always played out, he told me that he wanted a divorce, that he wasn't happy and he wanted to move on. At first, I thought he was playing some sort of joke on me, some sort of cruel, devastating prank. But soon I realized that he was being earnest, especially after he had mentioned that he had met someone else. I broke down and wept, unabashed despite being in a hardly uncrowded coffee shop. We went back and forth as you might expect, but Josh had made up his mind that it was over between us. We settled on an agreement that he would at least come for Christmas dinner and not tell the kids until after the holiday. That afternoon, I didn't go to Jennifer or Tobias' school to pick them up. They were still enraptured in the ignorant bliss of their adolescence, and I aimed to keep it that way. Instead, I drove to a dingy motel in the outskirts of town, but not before picking up a fifth of vodka from the liquor store. Once I had arrived, I proceeded to get toasted in a squalid, bleach-reeking little bedroom. I can't explain why I didn't just do this at home, but I just couldn't. I needed to get away. I wasn't worried about driving home drunk either. As far as I was concerned, there was nothing left to live for. It was in that gloomy green room that I realized it wasn't just Josh that I was going to lose, but I was going to lose my children. Before you asked, no, there was nothing I had done that would have stripped me of custody, and Joshua wouldn't have wanted full custody anyway, not with this new lady on his arm. No, I was losing my children and that they were growing older and more independent, and inevitably, they were going to leave me. Leave me for university, for college, or for just work. Leave me the way that Joshua was leaving me. I now know like I knew then that that was natural. All children leave eventually. They must, and I know that. But I had never planned for that eventuality, not emotionally, not spiritually. It might have been the booze, but at that moment in that dim avocado room, I felt the walls closing in on me, the very roof over my head collapsing. Everything that I had built and dreamed of since I was a little girl was falling apart, falling on top of my head. After a few more plastic cupfuls of vodka, I started reading the newspaper that I had picked up from the stand beside the check-in desk. Now it might come from me majoring in English Lit during my undergrad, but I've always found reading more relaxing than vegetating in front of the tube. Even in my inebriated state, I can make out most of the stories printed on the pulpy pages. Gradually, I found myself scanning sections that I wouldn't have bothered reading before. The sports section, the obituaries, and eventually, the classifieds. It was there that I saw a very peculiar ad. Unhappy with your life, call us. We sell dreams by the skyfall. The corporate logo in the middle just said, Morgan Stern Legion and Associates. 
The tawdry little advert looked fittingly cheap with no color or pictures. The letters were ludicrously shaped and emblazoned. The whole thing just radiated of sleaze. We sell dreams by the skyfall, what rubbish. For no reason other than to get a cheap laugh, I drunkenly dialed the number. When someone answered and after enduring their kitschy slogan, I forgot what I had dialed for. Instead of having a laugh and asking any of the stupid questions that I had prepared, I broke down much like I had at the coffee shop and told the faceless stranger exactly what had happened, exactly what I was feeling and what I was afraid might happen in the immediate future. Everything, including my fears of my children eventually growing up and leaving me, leaving the old and wanted hag that I would inevitably become. I don't know what force compelled me to confide to the would-be receptionist like I did, but that's what happened. Once I was finished, nothing left to divulge except my sniffles. I didn't hear a dial tone. Instead, there was a long palpable silence from the other end. It was almost as though I could feel the other person chewing over what I had just rattled off to them. And then I heard a male voice say to me, Lorraine, get yourself sober and then drive up to her office at 948 McCallion Road. It's near Pacific Circle. We'll be expecting you. It was dark out by the time that I had managed to get a solid enough grip on my sobriety to drive to the address. It was in an industrial area of town, lots of warehouses and body shops. Their office was a one-story cinder block building, painted mustard, crammed on top of a small clearing in front of an ongoing construction site. It looked temporary and cheap, but the tall, luminescent windows burning through the early dusk had beckoned to me inside. A set of tinkling tin bells announced my arrival through the glass door. The room was devoid of life save for the percolating aquarium mounted next to the far wall. It didn't take long though before I heard footsteps approaching from the adjacent hallway. And that's when I first met the red-headed, used to car salesman looking creature named Mr. Morgenstern. He greeted me by name and shook my hand, and then guided me to his desk. There was nothing otherworldly or even strange about his appearance. He wore a green and orange suit, which looked like it was made from the same material as the carpet in my motel room, with a yellow tie and a scuzzy pair of tan shoes. His cologne was sweet-smelling though, he wore too much of it, no doubt to mask a lingering tobacco or whiskey odor. Even his voice was perfectly normal, though a bit high-pitched for someone his size and age. He wasn't muscular or fat but looked thick and durable, like a street lamp. I didn't need to learn anything about him. I could just sense from his presence that he wasn't human, and that he was evil. He pushed the obligatory box of Kleenex to my end of the desk and asked me one more time to relay what had happened and what my fears were. Dry-eyed, I recited what Joshua had told me of my anxiety-filled terrors of my children in the future. He listened without reacting, his hands forming a tent beside his plump, liver-colored lips. When I was done, he made his offer to me as plain as possible. Kill my immediate family and then myself on any day of the year of my choosing and my family and I would relive that year in blissful ignorance for eternity. The method of killing wouldn't matter. I just had to make sure that I committed the act in the same day every rotation, and that I didn't let on to anyone that what they were experiencing was an illusion. Only my family and I would be the actual souls reliving the year on lobe. Everyone else would be a projection of our memories and Morgan Stern's manipulation. When I first heard his proposition, I of course balked. Kill my family so that we could live together for eternity. What kind of psycho stuff was that? Why should I believe anything that he said? He then asked me if I remembered a man named Francois Ouliette. I had, and it was a horrific story of an investor who had been driven to death from an unrecoverable debt. He had slain his wife and kids and then himself in a weekend. This had occurred in a city not far from ours in 2003 and it was reported on all the news networks for weeks. Mr. Morganston then rose from his desk and motioned for me to follow him down the hall from which he had come. It took me to a vast azure filing room where he pulled open a long metal drawer and proceeded to thumb through the tabs. His hand eventually landed on a single beige folder. He pulled out the manila file and he handed it to me. 
Inside was a series of black and white photographs and newspaper clippings. I inspected them and saw a familiar face. Francois. He was smiling happy, surrounded by his equally contented family. The articles reported of his opulent lifestyle. Summer homes in the Bahamas, yachts, resorts. What was truly strange were the dates printed on each picture and article. 2003-2005. 2010-2012. How was it possible? The man and his family were long dead, and it was still 2005. I gawked up at the creature and he stared back at me with hooded eyes and an undefined smile on his face. It took me a minute before I found my tongue. How do I know these are real? I asked in a breathy laugh. The obvious question. Of course, they could be fakes. Doctored photos and phony stories, but holding them in my hands, feeling the fantastic joy radiating from the paper, I knew they were the genuine article. I mean, they had to be. You don't know, honey bunch. Mr. Morgenstern answered, sliding the drawer back into place, his voice blunt and concrete. I could show you a million photographs and articles like those, and I could bore you into a coma with a thousand testimonials from other clients now enjoying their blissful pockets of existence. But none of that matters in the end. You have to decide. Do you believe it? Are you willing to believe? I was. I was very willing and ready. I'd love to tell you that I waited a day or two before deciding to carry out the deed, agonizing over the mortality of what had to be done. But I didn't, not really. I didn't need any more goading or assurance. I only waited two days so as to prepare everything for that night, and so I could have one last Christmas dinner with my family, one that would last forever. So that was that. I settled on his proposition and up until now, I have fulfilled my end of the agreement. He had never asked for anything in return, as though the limbo of 2005 was his payment for the gruesome act that I was to commit. Though I'm sure in some other ghastly way he made more than a handsome profit off the deal. For ten or more years I've done this, living in near perfect harmony with my husband and children. That is, until Jennifer got wise and had to ruin it. Now, let me address the eight-ton elephant in the room. How could I do it? How could a mother do such a thing to her own children? Can anybody hearing this honestly say they wouldn't just jump at the opportunity to live forever with their loved ones? Can anyone say that if given the choice, they wouldn't repeat the same year, hack the same day? if it was the one of their choosing. We all chase nostalgia that perfect moment or opportunity long gone. We all know the pang of regret and the nibbling power of fantasies of what could have been. Very few of us actually seek out the truth. Most of us are happy living on our own daily play acting, hoping that we project an image convincing enough to fool our relatives and neighbors. Oh, I know. I'm not answering your real question. How could I kill my own kids? Well, that part is simple. It was part of the bargain I made with Mr. Morganson to keep them for eternity. To keep them from ever growing up. From ever leaving me. But Lorraine, you protest. Why wouldn't you want them to grow up? Didn't you want to see them graduate from high school, from college? Didn't you want to attend your only daughter's wedding? These examples that you're mentally listing are my point exactly. We don't live for our kids' survival. We live for the moments. We don't pine after our children's wedding because we're happy to see them married or in love, or starting their own family, though we may like weddings as a symbol of all those things. We only live for the moments, these moments that we ate to revisit and stay stuck in. That's why we take photographs, why we use camcorders. We don't want to progress or even get to the next exquisite moment. We want to preserve those moments and live them over again and again and again and again. And by the way, Tobias and Jennifer would inevitably have learned this pain themselves. In a way, I was sparing my children from these snowballing malaise of the years. Is that answer not sufficient for you? Maybe you need to sit on it for a day or two, then you'll see. Trust me, you'll know what I mean. Now, don't you dare judge me. Don't you dare tell me that I'm a bad mother. I didn't grow up in suburbia or even in the city. I grew up in a rural hamlet outside of Hamilton. My father was away three quarters of the year working the mines of the Canadian Shield, then working the power lines in every part of the country but the one that my brother and I lived in. 
My mother, a pinched, gaunt woman, raised me and my brothers like she had lost some monstrous bet. She believed in the adages, children should be seen and not heard, and spare the rod to spoil the child. Forget leaving welds, she broke bones, bones some of which never healed the right way. My oldest brother didn't make it before his 18th birthday. For longer than I can recall, all I ever wanted was to get out and find someone, to get married and have the perfect little family, just like the Huxtables or the Cleavers on TV. In fact, since I was a little girl, I wanted a little girl that I could name Jennifer. That fantasy was my only outlet, my only escape from my hamlet in that house. I suppose yes. I was chasing an idea more than a tangible goal. I wanted the family scene in serial commercials. I wanted that over the arduous work of raising two human beings and dealing with the heartache of seeing them grow up. Fine, I'm a romantic, a plastic romantic, perfectly tacky, and out of touch with how the real world works. I admit it, but don't you dare tell me that I didn't love my children. After all, what purer love is there than the love of your dreams, your ideals? It's been two days now since Jennifer and Tobias drove off in that vehicle, and the same van I presume belongs to Christine and her mute. Nothing has happened yet. Mr. Morgenstern has not called me, nor has anyone for that matter. I don't even know if I'm still in 2005, or if I'm even on the same planet. It feels like I'm the last living soul on Earth. Joshua is starting to smell, and it's hard to believe, but after all this death, I've never had to dispose of a body. There is no need until now. I can't bring myself to touch him. Somehow contact with the body after its dead seems wrong, perverse. I see blowflies hovering outside his office door. I hear them buzzing incessantly. Even the dead of winter can't stop the flies. Pretty soon I won't be able to stand it. I look outside and only see the endless snow, neither plowed nor shoveled. The garbage uncollected. I don't know what will happen to me when I finally step outside my door. I'm just typing this out on my computer, not hoping that anyone will read it exactly but trying to get it all down, trying to steal myself before the final plunge into what lies beyond my door and to what awaits me outside my home.